the uh, next point which is made here in the Sutta is clear comprehension. And it is said again that has to go together with mindfulness. Now, as we will be talking about clear comprehension, mindfulness will also come into it. I have explained in detail mindfulness on the body. I will use the other three also in detail. But clear comprehension, I've already explained it as having four points. But those four points, or four parts, I should say, that I have used so far are the everyday kind that we can use in daily life but are not suitable for retreat purposes. Clear comprehension for retreat purposes looks different and some people do it spontaneously. They don't even have to be told. And others, of course, don't do it even when they're told, but that's another story. So, we have clear comprehension. I'll repeat what I've already said. Purpose, skillful means, is it within the Dhamma? Have I achieved the purpose? That's for everyday, everyday life. If we check out everything that we think, say and do with those four, we're pretty safe. And uh, safety is a point because we are constantly in danger of making bad karma. Every negativity makes bad karma. And the more bad karma we make, the more accumulation of it we have. But now for retreat purposes, it looks different. Because in the retreat, we have let go of our obsession, I should say, with daily matters, to some extent at least, or some quite uh, a lot of it. So we have now a close connection to spiritual truth and spiritual investigation. And so clear comprehension looks quite different. And in this particular discourse, it's also explained quite differently. The first thing, the purpose. Now the purpose of what we hear now, think, say and do, should be ascertained whether it pertains to one of the three characteristics of the universe. It no longer needs to be inquired whether the purpose is something good, useful, beneficial or wholesome. It needs to be looked at whether it pertains to insight into anicca dukkha anatta, one of the three. Impermanence, dukkha, corelessness whether what I'm thinking, saying, or doing. Now, when we have in the meditation, we have, of course, two streams of activity. We have the stream of activity which leads us to calm and tranquility. And yet, I have said many times already, at the end, all we see that too is impermanent. And in some of the higher stages of absorption, the question is also, where was I? So again, the calm and tranquility aspect of the meditation leads us into the insight, into, or leads us into the inquiry into insight, I should say. But now we don't always sit here and meditate. There are other thought processes going on. There are other activities going on. Some of the activities that we have are necessary. And if we can use those also in order to see that whatever it is we're doing 
or whatever it is that we're thinking or whatever it is that we might be saying is also impermanent then we have a very useful purpose in that activity we can also inquire where am I in this what is the me in this activity why do I think that I'm doing this or saying this or thinking this where does this thought come from it's me now this purpose in a retreat situation is the foremost activity impermanence is covered over by continuity dukkha is covered over by change and corelessness is covered over by solidity so I have already spoken about impermanence quite a lot of times that we don't see that the breath is impermanent because it keeps coming we don't see that our body is completely impermanent because it keeps arising again it's falling apart and arising again that's why it looks so different from what it looked 20 years ago but we just take that now as stride and say yes well nobody gets any younger finished but we don't see it what it really is what it really is that it's fallen apart every second and comes back together continuity and with with that we don't see the reality of this flux and flow now the flux and flow of impermanence is one of the directions that the mind should take whenever and wherever so if we want to inquire what is the purpose of what I'm doing it could very well be that the activity is supposed to hide knowing one of those three things which it usually is that's what activities are all about because they um, at this point in time here the activities which are necessary are very minute so if we look at impermanence and get a better understanding of it we may also choose one of the other two any one of those three any one of those three leads to exactly the same result it doesn't matter which one one picks now a person who has faith and confidence in the teaching is mostly inclined to pick impermanence as the investigating as the investigation subject a person who is well concentrated is mostly inclined to choose dukkha and a person who is analytically inclined would choose substancelessness or corelessness but that's not a hard and fast rule it's perfectly all right to choose whichever one appears interesting that particular moment or day as long as we pick one of them they are called the T lakanas T means three lakana means characteristic the three characteristics of the universe that's all there is and under those three headings everything can be found now that's also an investigation subject is that really so is that really that everything can fall under those headings that is a very important investigation subject so if our mind is busy thinking this and that 
we need to direct it towards one of those three and say, well, if you want to think, think about that. There are two ways, or there are more ways than that, but there are two primary ways of thinking. And this is often a cause for misunderstanding. People often say, well, I thought we weren't supposed to think. Well, if you want to get into the meditative absorptions, no, you're not supposed to think. That's quite true. Calm and tranquility cannot appear at the same time as thinking. And discursive thinking, worldly thinking, is never useful in a meditation retreat. But an examination of phenomena, of whatever there is, manifestations, an examination of these things with the view in mind to understand impermanence better or to understand dukkha better or to understand substancelessness better, it needs the intelligent mind to ponder but it's not discursive thinking. It becomes discursive thinking when the mind goes something like this. Ah oh yes, breath is impermanent. I know everything is impermanent. Why shouldn't it be? It's not really interesting. Maybe I could find something a little more interesting. Let me have a look at what's out here. Ah, oh, that's a very nice little bird. Is he impermanent too? Oh, I'm sure he's impermanent. <laughs> that's discursive thinking. It just goes from one thing to the next. It doesn't go into the depth of anything. To really see the depth, one has to stay with oneself. One can use nature around one in order to refer to oneself, to have another proof that the impermanence is all around and therefore also within. The doorway that leads to liberation and freedom, which goes through the understanding, the, reali the realization of impermanence, is called the signless liberation. Now we're going to get to that at a later stage, but signless means that we can see because of impermanence there is really nothing that we can get a hold of that we can hang on to and that will remain within that formation that it is everything is in constant flux and flow now in order to have a feeling for that one has to do this many times one doesn't get a feeling for that just once or twice. It takes time to feel oneself impermanent. To know oneself impermanent and to feel oneself impermanent, the difference is miles apart. But if one doesn't know oneself impermanent, one will never feel oneself impermanent. So, because our understanding is usually our first step, not always, there are people who operate differently, but generally speaking, everybody operates like that. We do have to know it, therefore we have to investigate it. And then, having investigated it with thought and attention, then, eventually, we can get a feel for that. The um, <clears throat> liberation the door, the door of liberation for dukkha is called the wishless liberation. And it means just that, that we can really investigate when there's any kind of unhappiness within oneself that it's because of unfulfilled wish. That's the only reason. 
Now, if one can't find any unhappiness within oneself, and it doesn't have to be anything gross or material, but if one can't find one, one hasn't looked. It's impossible. There is no such thing. Dukkha is. It's not a personal tragedy. It's not a personal failure. It's a universal characteristic. It is never removed through pleasure. It just isn't. It has its moments when it is overshadowed by joy. But what is joy? Also impermanent. The two belong together. Impermanence and dukkha belong together. Nothing can be totally satisfying because it can't remain. If one is satisfied with second best, third best, it comes and it goes, so I'll take it at face value and hope for the best. That is what humanity does. It <coughs> takes what it can get and tries to get a little more. But if we really want to have freedom and want to lose all oppression and want to get rid of dukkha once and for all, and one would assume that that's what we're here for, maybe one doesn't quite know it what, what, why, but one would assume that that's what the reason is, then we have to understand dukkha in its most profound and deepest manifestation. We use dukkha in everyday life in the wrong way. We, what we usually do is we try to get away from it. And that's why it said, Dukkha is overshadowed through movement, trying to get away from it. Now, trying to get away from it in everyday life means that we try to get something else. That means we're never quite satisfied. That's why people find it difficult to have inner contentment, a basis where that inner life is purified enough so that it no longer presents any difficulty to look at it, to live with it, to be embedded in it. That can only happen with contentment. When the mind tries to move from one thing to the next, it's the same thing, trying to get away from dukkha, because we don't really want to know what's going on. The more the mind is moving, the more we're trying to get away. Whatever the dukkha is doesn't matter. Dukkha just is. And when we have accepted the fact that it is, then it no longer hurts. Because we don't have to hide from it. We don't have to hide ourselves from other people. We don't have to pretend we don't have to fantasize and we don't have to search for its removal in the world. There is no removal of dukkha in the world. It just doesn't happen. If it would, somebody would have found out about it by now. Our billboards say that they have found it, but I don't know whether anybody believes that. And uh, some of the magazines claim it too, that they have found the answer. And then there, of course, there are all these books that claim they have found the answer. But then, if one investigates that a little further, then one sees that that too is only a temporary answer. It's not the complete and total solution of human dukkha. The first thing in order to have 
less dukkha is to accept the fact that it's there that it exists wherever we look that's the first thing and then to realize its cause and there's only one cause so simple not getting what one wants or getting what one doesn't want either way and then it would be very useful to inquire what is it that I want and write it down on a piece of paper what is the most important thing I want and maybe there are a lot of different things and one can eventually cross them all off it will all boil down to one thing find out what it is what do I want and every time dukkha arises because one didn't get something else not that important thing but something else see how absurd it is it doesn't matter none of these things matter what is it what one really wants one wants complete peace complete harmony within happiness joy freedom no worries, no troubles whatever you call it peace anything, make it one word and then something else happens and you don't get something and you're all upset about it or you get something and you're still upset about it that's not what you wanted and you can see the absurdity then the mind is on the right path only then that's the purpose that's the purpose of thinking during a retreat Otherwise, thinking during a retreat should be forbidden. <laughs> Since that doesn't do any good, it's never done. <laughs> so, when we see that something arises within which has a connotation of unhappiness, of uh, dissatisfaction, of even dislike rejection anything like that find out what is it that I didn't get is it really what I want that one thing I didn't get has it any bearing on what I'm really trying to do and you'll find immediately it doesn't it's all superficial everyday kind of unimportant details which have no bearing on the reality of what one tries to do in a meditation retreat meditation retreat of this length is like surgery and one has to be willing to cut out all the all the inner growth which is detrimental to one's own purity just like in surgery one cuts out those things which are diseased that's what a meditation retreat's all about and one can only do that because one is the patient and the surgeon all rolled into one one can only do that if one can see in there what's going on as long as one can't see it how can a surgeon operate if he doesn't know what's wrong so here we have the best possible chance and if we have if we take advantage of such a of that we will look again and again and that is the purpose then of our thought of our investigation of our meditation one is calm and tranquility that's one and that has to be done calm and tranquility has to be done because the mind that is not calm and tranquil will never find what needs to be cut out of there if we have an operation in an, in an operation theater and the uh, surgeon is all upset about all sorts of things well he's going to make a mess of it isn't he he's got to have a fairly calm mind to get in there 
Well, this one has to be even calmer. So that's absolutely essential because it is our uh, tool. It's a tool that we use. But with that tool, then, we have the clear purpose of looking in there and seeing what is it that creates lack of peace, lack of harmony, lack of happiness, uh, lack of contentment, lack of inner uh, realization. What is it? What is there? To find it. And we will find that there are a lot of things that we want over which we have no jurisdiction. We can't get them when we want them. We want appreciation, we want an ego support system, we want comfort, we want all things which are totally unimportant, which are on the worldly level, but have nothing to do with the spiritual life. The spiritual life is on an entirely different level. It has a, a different connotation. So when we can see that we want these things, we will see that that produces dukkha. The wanting produces dukkha. Whether we get it then or not, that's the second question. The wanting produces the dukkha. So that is an investigation which leads us in the right direction. Dukkha arises also because we are not geared towards, in our everyday life, towards looking for it within. We're constantly looking for it without, out there. There's something wrong out there. Well, obviously there's something wrong. There's something wrong everywhere. Dukkha is a universal characteristic. Of course, of course there's something wrong. But <clears throat> that should not pr produce Dukkha for us. It produces Dukkha because we're reacting. So we can check all that out and then our thinking has a very good purpose. Now the third characteristic, the one which is very much favored by people who are analytically inclined, and again anybody can choose any of those three and change them each day, it doesn't matter. The unutta the non-I, the non-me. It has a lot of um, aspects which need to be investigated. If, for instance, our thought goes in that direction when we're eating or walking or sitting down or getting up, and just checking out, who is this doing that? Who is this wanting something? And the answer keeps coming back, well, this is me. Then the next question is, where do I find the me? Do I find it within this body, or do I find it within this mind? Where is it hiding? Why can't I put my finger on it? Why is it only a thought and a feeling why can't I actually point to it and say, there it is, unchangeable, over and over again, the same me. This is a very important investigation. Which one of all these different thoughts and feelings, observations, perceptions that we have, which one is called me? And if we think that all of them are called me, which we do, then we'll have to accept the fact that there are millions of me's, each one thinking, feeling, reacting, expressing differently. So with millions of me's, we also have the uh, habit of saying, for instance, we get angry at somebody and later on we're very sorry about that. 
and will say, oh, I'm sorry about what I said this morning. I wasn't myself. Well, which one was I then? The nasty one, the nasty me. The nice me had just left and the nasty one had come. And then the nasty one goes away and the nice one comes back. So we've got all these different me's which are we're trying to put under into one category, put it together and make it a solid whole. That's what we're trying to do all the time. We're trying to make this me solid. That's why we want to be appreciated and praised and uh, supported and looked after and cared for and all the rest of it. We want to make that me solid. But it can't. It can't be done because it's constantly moving. It never stays the same one minute after the next or one second after the next. So if we investigate in that direction during the times that we are doing anything, that's a good purpose. Anatta, literally translated, means non-me. An is the uh, syllable for non, or an is the same in English. Un in English and an in uh, Pali. And atta is me. But it goes further than that. But where we have to hook into is the me. That's our investigation procedure. When we see that, then we will also see that the substance which we give everything, the importance which we give everything, is also an illusion. Like the importance that we give and the significance that we put into material things the significance which we put into <coughs> knowledge, the significance which we put into the happenings, into anything at all, all that, then also falls into place. Nothing has substance, constantly moving. What was important yesterday, nobody even talks about anymore today. It's all forgotten. So we can see that if we have, if we put our mind in that direction. And this is something that's also very often misunderstood and probably not brought out clearly enough. Because the idea is, oh, I'm not supposed to think. The Buddha said many times, Yuniso Maniskara, wise consideration using the mind wisely. And these are the three aspects of using the mind wisely. Now, in which form we do it, I'm only giving examples. I'm giving um, possibilities and suggestions. Whichever way is fine. But it's got to have those, one of those three within why am I doing this? How can I find out why am I doing it? What is it that I'm doing? How, why am I doing it? Why am I thinking it? What is it? And use one of those three to find the answer. The wise consideration is not that kind of discursive thinking that is so detrimental to spiritual practice and also takes us away from the essential part of what's going on within. Wise consideration is using the mind wisely. That's all it is. And it is a word that is used by the Buddha over and over again. And not only that, but putting the mind in the direction where one wants to use it I've said that many times, but I'm saying it again because it appears to be still a point of um, misunderstanding. If I want to cook a meal, I've got to put my mind on what I'm going to do. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to cook a meal. I'm going to have to put my mind on what are the ingredients, how do I want it to come out. I have a plan. I put the ingredients together and then I cook it 
and then I get hopefully what I planned. If I want to understand the Buddha's teaching, I've got to put my mind on what it is that I want to understand. I've got to put it in that direction. What is my plan? What do I want to find out? What is my plan? Write it down on a piece of paper. What do I want? How am I, what is it actually what I'm trying to achieve with sitting with crossed legs on a pillow? Do I want to get a bit of a tummy ache? Well, that's really not good enough, is it? Or do I, do I just want to have a, a bit of peace and quiet while I'm sitting here and have the same thing going on again in my mind when I go out? Or do I really want to get some freedom? Get rid of the oppression that we put on ourselves. Make a plan. It's like an architect makes a plan. He can't build a house without a plan. It's impossible. This is much more important than building a house. This is the most important thing one can ever do in one's life. So an architect makes a plan how to build a house, pay, uh, draws it all nicely, and then gets the ingredients together, the bits and pieces which are needed, and knows exactly where to put them. And so the mind is used to build an edifice. This is what we're doing. We're building an edifice of spiritual insight. The mind's got to make, be totally geared towards that. And it mustn't, mustn't fall off it, at least as little as possible. Obviously everybody's mind wanders off here and there. But we must try and bring it back again to the purpose we have in mind. What is this edifice I'm trying to build? What's my purpose? What do I really have in mind? And when I know what my purpose is, what is this edifice, make a plan and get the ingredients together. Now I have given many different ways of meditation. These are the ingredients. Many different ways of, for insight, different ways for calm. These are the ingredients. If you have any other ideas, use them. Whatever works is right. But it's got to work for insight into those three directions. And for calm and tranquility, it has to work towards the absorptions. It's so simple and it's so well laid out. It's an edifice laid out by the Buddha with step by step where we can see exactly how we have to proceed on every step. Obviously, it's only afterwards when we've done it that we can look back and say, aha, these are the steps I've taken. But at least we have the steps there. But we have to make our own plan. I will again talk about Anicca Dukkha Nata because they will come up again as inside moments. But here they are part of clear comprehension. Now the second step on clear comprehension as far as the uh, retreat situation is concerned is the same one and it's called suitability. Now we had before we, I was uh, calling it skillful means <coughs> but here it's used the word suitability. Is what I'm doing suitable? Suitable for spiritual advancement, growth for inner purification. Is that what I'm doing? Or am I doing things which I'm always doing at home and are always having bad results? Check it out. And what we're doing with will mostly happen in the thinking process because there isn't any much uh, activity and there isn't that much talking. So it's usually the thinking process which will take us off the purpose. So the suitability is exactly the same thing. Am I, am I using the right means? Have I understood the meditation procedure? And if I haven't, have I asked? And if I haven't under, if, am I using the meditation procedure? Or am I off on a tangent? So here we have very uh, limited suitability, which is great. The more limited one is, 
the more one can go forward. The more we um, go into proliferation, the less possibility of going forward we have. So if we have, we check out the suitability. If I want to become calm, what's suitable? What's my suitable meditation subject? And if I want to gain insight, am I using the suitable means? It seems, and I will uh, mention some one of the meditation methods, it seems that I have in this retreat not mentioned one of the quite important insight methods which I have mentioned in the last seven-day retreat before we came here, because I've mentioned it to some people, and they said, oh, I've never heard this. So I will quickly mention this. I think that everybody's heard it by now, but I'll mention it anyway. And that is to pretend we have a zipper in front. Open up the zipper and take out every bit and piece that you can find inside. Now, whether you find everything or not that's in there doesn't really matter. But you, you, everybody knows that they've got a heart and a gallbladder and liver and kidneys and uh, intestines and blood and pus and all the rest of it, that's what's in there. Feel it and see it. Take it out and put it in front of you. And having done that, take out the bones and pile them up nicely and neatly. And then look at all the mess and say, where am I in all this? The answer is obvious, of course. Then take the whole kit and caboodle and put it back in nicely and zip it all up. And then say, ah, here I am again. And then look at the absurdity of it. While it's all lying out there, there's nobody there. And when it's inside, it's all, uh, it's me. It's a very important aspect. It's called the 32 parts of the body, but whether you find 32 parts or not doesn't really matter. I mean, you can do it with 25 just as well. It's so important because we are infatuated and identified with this mess that we consist of, which works quite nicely to a certain extent, but there's always something wrong with it. Always. In fact, if you ask a doctor, he'll say, everybody is sick. Well, the Buddha said that's quite true, but he didn't mean the body. He meant the mind. So, check it out. There's no, this is not designed to make one disgusted with the body. This is designed to make one totally equanimous. It's neither me nor wonderful, nor is it something that is awful. It just is. When we see a dead bird lying there, we don't think it's awful. It's just a dead bird, isn't it? Well, it's the same here. No difference. Or if you see a dead flower, or a flower that's fallen apart and it's got all bits and pieces lying about, so what is it? It's just a flower with all its bits and pieces lying about, isn't it? It's very simple to be equanimous towards that flower that's fallen apart. So this is the same. This is one of the many insight methods. The other insight methods is to take the to use the elements which we have discussed. I know we have, um, and we also have discussed the four aggregates of the mind: impermanence, the dukkha which comes from wishing. So our suitability of the meditation or the contemplation subject. Now the third step on clear comprehension is called quite differently and it's called the resort where before it was called is it within the Dhamma. Now here it is called is it the resort. It, it, it's, uh, it's not a holiday place that's not meant with that it is where we are resorting to 
Now that has several connotations. I'm going to get to this. <laughs> that has uh, several connotations of resort. And the most important aspect of it, of the resort, is the usage of the meditation subject under all circumstances. Now, it is said under this item resort that there are some who take it with them but don't bring it back. There are some who don't take it with them and don't bring it back. There are some who don't take it with them and bring it back, and then there are some who take it with them and bring it back. Well, that means that some people, when they get up from the pillow, remember mindfulness and take it with them. But halfway through their work or whatever they're doing, they forget about it and they don't... Those who forget all about it when they get up from the pillow, but halfway through there somewhere in the courtyard, they remember, uh-uh, mindfulness. And they start using it again and then bring it back in here. Then there are those who forget it completely. They're just so glad to get up from the pillow, just to get the whole thing and just <laughs> want to have a rest. And so they don't take it out and they don't bring it back. And then there are those who actually do get up and remember it and then actually keep on remembering and bringing it back. So those are the four kinds. And primarily, I'll use it now for mindfulness. There are other aspects of it which I'll also, also use. But first, the resort, resorting to mindfulness. Now, I have already said that it's very important to use the body and I've given many different aspects of using the body. There are many more. It's impossible to give you all the examples. I mean, you know what your body is doing. And uh, the more you're focused on it, the more the mind is together. I mean, why do people fall apart? Because their minds are falling apart, because they're not there, they can't keep it in one place going all over the place and they want this and they want that and they can't get this and they can't get that and the whole thing falls falls to pieces but if your is keeps mindfulness going then that can never happen so we have first foundation body kaya nupasana then we have second foundation vedana nupasana feeling now that's feeling which is emotion and also sensation sensation is body Feeling, we can use for emotion. Both go under feeling. Now, primarily, we have pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. But that's not the way we operate. The way we operate is that an emotion arises and we don't even become aware of the fact whether it's pleasant or unpleasant. We know it's either anger or irritation or dislike or boredom or um, resistance or rejection or it is wanting and hoping and uh, wishing and planning we have that feeling in us and immediately the mood comes with it so this is something that when we have an objectivity towards that we don't need to react to it we don't have to believe it so that's our second foundation of mindfulness. If the body movement is overshadowed by an emotion. You see, the body movement is primary. That's the first one. But if that is overshadowed by an emotion which is coming up strong, then that, of course, takes pride of place. We can't help that. And then, if we're not objective towards it, and just looking at it and saying, oh, well, that has come up, well, let's wait for it to cease again. But we start reacting to it. Then, of course, we find ourselves in a complete emotional upheaval. 
I don't like him, I don't like her, I can't stand it, I don't want it. The whole uh, gamut of the reaction which then either deteriorates in hate or in greed. Where else can it go? It hasn't got any choices. So, naturally, it's also possible that the emotion which arises is one which is useful and wholesome. And there we only have four. Now I have already given quite a detailed explanation of those in those in our seven day course, but I will talk about them again and just mention them right now. These four emotions are the only ones that the Buddha said are worth having. So we can have a very distinctive guideline to know whether it's useful to keep an emotion that has come up or drop it or substitute. The four which are useful to have are love, compassion, sympathetic joy and equanimity. These are the only four that are worth having. Now under those four we can find uh, subtitles gratitude, uh, generosity, uh, care, concern, nurturing, um, being uh, helpful. All these things are subtitles. They all have devotion. They all have love as their um, helpmate. And their sort of outcome of love. Now these four are these are the emotions which are useful and beneficial. Everything else needs to be dropped. Now if we use mindfulness rightly, if we really use it and do not let up using it, the mind is pinpointed enough and one pointed enough so that it can drop the unwholesome emotion. But if we only use it once in a while, mindfulness, you know, like the one that takes it out but doesn't bring it back. If we use it once in a while, the mind is not strong enough. It cannot drop. Then we have to resort to substitution. Then we have to substitute that which is unwholesome and everything that's negative is unwholesome. Everything which says, I don't like it, it's not good, it's not nice, and be it ever so justified, it doesn't matter. It makes life miserable. And it prevents meditation. Negative mind prevents meditation, takes up all the energy that one can possibly muster. So the, the energy which, is, which goes away can only be resurrected through concentration. A positive mind is a mind that does not squander its energy but uses it for the meditation. And as we use it for the meditation and become calm and tranquil, then the things which are really important, which mean insight, become so clear that we don't have to be negative anymore. Our own negativities do not change anything. So the world's a mess. So what? So somebody wasn't nice to us. Well, so what? Somebody said something which was untrue. Well, so what? Is it going to change anything because we're feeling negative about it? The only thing that will change anything is when we see ourselves as we really are. Then we have changed something. We can change that which is inside of ourselves. That we can change. And then we have changed the world. Having changed ourselves, we have changed that part of the world that we touch. So there's nothing to be negative about. That some things are not good, well, that's understood. The whole world is anicca dukkha nata. So what else can we do about it? Changing ourselves. Negativity, if the mind is strong and one-pointed, can be dropped. That will be the quickest and therefore the best because it's the quickest. But if that's not possible, substitution. 
So anything that is negative needs to be substituted with something positive. We don't even have to think about it, whether this is now justified. We always like to make exceptions. <laughs> but this time I'm right. This person is terrible. I have to feel bad about that person. I can't stand him or her. So that's the exception then. Hmm? What's, what, what possible good can we do with that? All we're doing is spoiling our own meditation. And we are, the other thing that we're doing, we are postponing our own freedom. Postponing it again and again and again. And there's no such thing as an automatic evolution, as we heard already when all these other teachers were mentioned. Automatic freedom does not exist. We've got to work for it. So that one exception of negativity also doesn't do us any good. The objectivity of mindfulness will be helped greatly if we use clear comprehension with it. So if an unwholesome emotion or a negative emotion has arisen, we can immediately check out what's the purpose of this. What's the purpose? Anybody can figure that one out. Is it suitable? What's the suitability? This is the second uh, foundation of mindfulness, which is extremely important because our purification system has to go through heart and mind. Mind the thinking, the four supreme efforts, which I have already explained, and heart, the four supreme emotions which I will mention again in more detail even than this, because right now we're concerned with the mindfulness aspect of it. The third foundation of mindfulness is the thinking. And the thinking which has not just thinking, 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 we know we do that. It has the mood aspect in it. The way the Buddha explained it was, is this thought a thought which has a good purpose? Or is this an, is it a suitable thought? Or is this a thought which has no purpose? Or is it unsuitable? Again, we're using clear comprehension in order to know what sort of thought are we having. Is it just a thought to distract us? Or is it a thought to cover up so we don't have to really look. Now, it is very common. It's one of the most common mistakes that meditators make, that they're all intent on becoming calm and tranquil and they don't want to know what's going on underneath. As long as there is this sort of... Um, uh, fire burning within we've got to look what is feeding the fire calm and tranquil is a tool and it's very important tool but it's not the goal we've got to find out what's going on inside the fire that's burning are our wants our passions and we've got to find out what it is in there what is, what is it that keeps it burning? One of the most common questions that was asked in the Buddha's time, and it's still not uncommon today, is, was, um, what happens to the Buddha after death? And there is this story of Bhatshagotta, who was a wanderer of another sect, an ascetic of another sect. And he saw, went to the Buddha one time and he asked him, does the Buddha exist after death? And the Buddha said, no. And so he said, does the Buddha not exist after death? And the Buddha said, no. And he said, does he not exist and exist? And he said, no. Does he neither exist nor not exist? And the Buddha said, no. 
And so what your Buddha said, but you're saying no to every possibility. What am I going to do with that? So the Buddha said, go and bring some uh, small uh, branches. So he brought some small branches. And he said, now make a fire with these branches. And he said, okay, he made a fire. And then he said, Buddha said, now bring some more and throw them on the fire. So he brought some more and threw it on the fire. And he asked him, he said, is the fire going? I said, oh yes, going very well. He said, all right, now stop throwing branches on. So he stopped throwing branches on. And after a while, Buddha said to him, no, Vachagata, what happened to the fire? And Vachagata said, well, I went out. So the Buddha said to him, well, did it go up or down? Backward, forward, right or left? Vachagata said, no, 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 it didn't do any of that, it just went out. And so the Buddha said, that's right. That's what happens with the Buddha after death. No more feeding, no more nourishment for the fire of our passions. And if we don't find those inside, we're never going to be able to find out what we shouldn't throw on there. So the passions are both, of course, the greed and the hate. What we don't like and what we do like. Now some people have more of the one than of the other, naturally. Some are more hate and some are more greed. And the hate people are harder to live with and find it much harder to live with themselves, but they are so uncomfortable that they've got to practice. And the greed people are much easier to live with and they find it much easier to live with themselves because greed always promises and fulfillment. We're going to get something which is nice. So they feel quite all right, actually, about themselves, but they're not going to practice so well because they're always hoping that there's going to be some escape hatch somewhere where they don't have to sit and meditate. They're going to get it some other way. So the greed people have it easier in life but harder in practice. The hate people have it much harder in life but easier in practice. They're not going to get off the practice. They're going to stick to it. But on the other hand, the greed people can have devotion much easier. They find it much easier to fall into devotion, whereas the hate people find it much, much more difficult. So we have to look at that fire that's burning inside and see what is it that I'm throwing on there on that fire to keep it going. Because if I wasn't keeping it going, I'd be enlightened by now. So what is it what I'm throwing in there? Now that's mindfulness with clear comprehension as the resort to which we are resorting in a meditation retreat where everything else is totally immaterial. Nothing else matters. If we don't like this person, or don't like that person, or we don't like the music, we don't like the, the cars, we don't like the, the firecrackers, we, uh, it doesn't matter. What does it matter? That's just little more wood thrown on the, uh, wood on the fire there so that it burns a little better. That's all. It all keeps burning a little nicer. And we don't, uh, and all the things that we think about need to have direction to them. Now, obviously, that's not an easy thing to do. If it were so easy, it'd be very simple to become enlightened. But at least we know what to do. And that's something to be very grateful for. Third foundation of mindfulness called citta nupassana. Citta is mind. And citta nupassana means that we are actually aware of the fact what's, what our thinking process is all about, whether it is going in the right direction, whether we are using it properly. And the fourth foundation of mindfulness the content of the thought. Now that is going to take me at least two, three more evenings because that has enormously detailed instructions by the Buddha. The content of thought. Dhamma nupasana. 
Now, Dhamma is a word which is used in many different connotations. It's used as a teaching, it's used as phenomena, and here it is used as what is arising. So, we have the body just as it is. And this is also important. It's not necessary to just watch the body when we're doing walking meditation because we're doing slowly. But whatever, whatever the body is doing, just as it is. Because that's the way we are, that's what we want to know. And then we have feeling, where the emotions are those that are useful and those that are not, seeing that the negativities don't help us. And then we have the thinking, where we have already, as for purification, we have those four supreme efforts, but as a thinking, the, in the third foundation of mindfulness, we see whether that thinking, with a clear comprehension, is leading us towards the right purposes. And then we have the content, which I'm going to have to start on tomorrow. So, any questions? Yes. On the, the greed, I, I understand the dropping. I mean, it would be just like the hate of dropping its skull. But at times I find it very difficult to drop, I want something. Mm-hmm. Could you talk a little bit about substitution mm. of the wanting? Right. What, which, what shall we take? Shall we take food or shall we take a sports car or what, as an example? It makes it much easier when we um, have something real. A, a relationship. A, 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 a lady. A lady. Okay, okay, okay. Um, Well, if you have already a relationship, then we're not going to use that, are we? Or something, seeing somebody that attracts you. Is that what we're going to use? Uh, Either. Okay, all right. The the first thing to, the, uh, the opposite of that, in that particular case, for a person, would be compassion for that person's dukkha can be quite sure there is no there's nobody except arahant who has no dukkha it doesn't there, there's no such thing in the world so you can immediately when you see that person you can think i really feel that this very beautiful looking person i have real compassion for that person because they also have dukkha the next thing you can look at is the impermanence although you said the other day you can see that they're going to get uh, old and uh, and die, but it doesn't deter you. <laughs> but you haven't done it well enough. I'll tell you a story about that. Okay, it's um, one has to. Can you visualize? Oh yes. Yeah. Okay. You have to really visualize it. Really visualize it. There is the story of Kema. She was a queen. She was the wife of King Bimbisara, the mother of this Ayata Satu, who, about whom this uh, Sutta is, the one who killed his father. Now, she, she was very beautiful. And uh, in fact, she was supposed to be the most beautiful woman in that part of India. And she was very proud of it too. And she dressed herself up very beautiful all the time. And she used all the necessary um, cosmetics and jewelry and everything to look beautiful. Now her husband, King Bimbisara, he was a follower of the Buddha. He was very devoted to the Buddha. But she would never go along to listen to the Buddha because she had heard it said that the Buddha was not appreciative of women's beauty. And so she was afraid that if she went there and listened to him, that he would say something detrimental or something uh, derogative about her being dressed up and having cosmetics and jewelry and beautiful clothing, and then she would feel awful. So she didn't want to go along. So one day, King Bimbisara went, went again to listen to the Buddha, and the whole of the court went along, and she was left all alone in the palace. And so she thought, well, 
I must find out what he's really talking about. If I st- there's, I'm sure to be a huge crowd there. So uh, if I stand at the furthest edge of the crowd, he won't see me. And then he's not going to say anything about being all dressed up and having beauty and beauty and all that. So she did that. She went and stood at the furthest edge of the crowd. And there were hundreds and hundreds of people there. But he saw her immediately. And while they were standing there waiting for him to start talking, he made a vision appear. And he made this vision appear of a woman that was far more beautiful than Kema, fanning him. And when the Queen Kema saw that, she thought to herself, now what is this? I thought he didn't have any uh, appreciation of female beauty. And there's this woman, she's much better looking than I am. And look at the way she's dressed and all the, the jewelry she's got. <laughs> and she's fanning him. And she's standing quite near too. And while she, when he knew that he had her full attention, he made this woman grow a little older. She got a few wrinkles and uh, her body wasn't quite as young looking anymore. <laughs> And so Kema saw that and thought, gee, that poor woman looks a little older now already. <laughs> and then he made her look even older. She got a few gray hair, a few teeth fell out, and uh, her, her body sagged a little. And Kema got, she couldn't take her eyes off that. She, she thought, this poor woman, I wonder what's wrong with her. Look at her, she's getting older and older. And then she got even older. Then she had all gray hair and was all wrinkled and didn't have any teeth at all. And then and her body was sagging and she could hardly stand straight. And Kima was so concerned, said that this is terrible. The poor woman looks awful now. And then the woman fell down, the vision fell down and was dead. And at that moment, Kima understood she realized what it meant that the beauty was only for a moment and at that moment she became Arahant, fully enlightened and she went home cut off her hair, took off all her jewelry gave away her beautiful clothing and became a nun and she was then known as the the Buddha designated nuns and monks for having special attributes and she became known as the nun with the most wisdom because she had very good education so she understood the Buddha's teaching very well so you have to visualize that you see, you have to really see this woman getting older and older and older and dying and saying, well, what's, what, what is this I'm, I'm attracted to? Am I attracted to the 32 parts of the body? I mean, you've taken your own out by that time, presumably, so you know that everybody's got the same, right? Unless one or two are missing, but that doesn't matter. (laughs) (laughs) You know, some people run around with one kidney only, and some have a, you know, don't have this or that, but that's all right. Gallbladder can be taken out. Uh, You know that, and uh, you've taken that out, and you've realized the four elements in a person. So what is it that I'm so attracted to? Am I attracted to the skin that's holding all this together? Because it's got the right color and the nice right shape and it hasn't got any, any wrinkles yet? Well, how long is it not going to have any wrinkles? So you have to do that. You have to really... Um, well, that's then the purpose of Anicca Dukkha Anatta. That's a clear comprehension. But it's very helpful if you can visualize well because you can really see it when I, I can visualize well, uh, well it and when I tell this story I can actually see this vision you know sort of getting older 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 like when in a movie you can do that you know how it changes in a movie and then falling down and so it can try <laughs> but you see what happens is that the um, greed mind gets in there and says, I don't do that, what nonsense, I mean, she's beautiful now. You see, the mind gets in the middle of it, so you mustn't allow that. You must cut that and continue on that pathway, right? And that's a suitability then. Yeah. Tell me one day where that works, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, are there many different ways, or is there only one way to substitute or many different ways? 
substitute the unwholesome with the wholesome. Yes. Oh, many, many. Anything will do. So you can, you can evolve that yourself? Well, it's always got to be anicca dukkha anatta. It's always got to, has to go in the direction of either impermanence, dukkha, or non-self. Can I describe what I do? Yes, and certainly. Yes, you see the suffering that it has is causing yes. you, and because you don't want to suffer, you can let it go. Yes. Right. Well, that's dukkha. That's fine. That's first class. Can't be any better. <laughs> yes. Um, this was kind of like her question. You've given us a lot of different contemplation techniques, and we've got our samatha practice to do. So, um, it, are there any sort of guidelines to, to customizing your routine um, <laughs> optimally? I mean, obviously, <laughs> we could sit and, what, what's that and good? contemplate. Uh, you know, you could just sit and contemplate all day. One, sure. One contemplation, or you could just do the samatha practice. Um, and we've got a lot of variety to choose from. So, so how does one go about um, making that decision how to practice okay. um, and the walking? Yes. <laughs> well, I will have something to say about walking meditation too. That comes then with non-delusion. The fourth aspect is non-delusion of the queer comprehension. We come to that. Um, samatha, calm and tranquility, is a tool. It has to be established because without the proper tool we cannot build that edifice of insight. Okay? So that calm and tranquility must be established. Now, but because we have much time and many hours, the mind of some people, not of everybody, and, but we have to take into account that there are different people here, sometimes balks and says, oh, I don't want to do this anymore, I've done it already, or this, uh, I'm bored. So then it has to have another resort that it can resort to. It has to have a choice. If it is f um, very much forced to do only one thing, it can become quite ornery and turn around and say, I don't want this. I'm doing something else. So we can do that. But, generally speaking, loving kindness must be done as, uh, to oneself in order to have that feeling of contentment. Right? That only needs a moment. Samatha practice has to be done because we need the tool. And some insight practice also needs to be done because the samatha will not be so perfect right away and we will then not use our time for insight at all. So we have to use both. Whichever you use from the inside practices, that's totally immaterial. doesn't matter. Any one of them will do. It's, they're all going towards anicca dukkha And mindfulness has to be used all the time. Mindfulness is sort of the, the overall, um, overall lord of it all. It's there all the time. I mean, unless we forget, of course. Then it's not there. It's, does that answer your question? Um, I'm not still totally clear on it. Is, uh, what I seem to hear you saying is um, whatever keeps your interest going? Yes, that's partial, partially that. Interest as far as long as 
the purpose and the suitability are being um, cared for. I mean, the, the tranquility practice, once it has been established, always will keep your interest going. You can't help it. But it mustn't come to the point where that is again only a, well, almost like a turning away from inside. Can be that too. So we have to practice inside also. So with mindfulness as one's uh, support system and tranquility as a tool, Inside needs to be practiced with any of the other methods. It doesn't even have to be a method. If we watch our thoughts and see whether they're going towards anicca, dukkha, or natta, that's already inside. Any of it. And you have to have some choices because you're not going to remember all of them anyway. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Uh, it's easier for me sure, that's good. That's fine. And contemplation on on impermanence, contemplation on on your own death, whatever it is. Any one of them will do. Okay. Anything else? Please put the attention on the breath for just a few moments. Now fill your heart with compassion for yourself. Compassion for the difficulties that every human being has. Compassion for all the striving. Compassion for the unfulfilled wishes. Compassion for decay, disease, and death. Fill yourself with compassion. Surround yourself with compassion. Accepting the fact that it's difficult to be a human being. And compassion makes it easier. Fill the person nearest you in this room with compassion. Compassion for his or her difficulties. For all unfulfilled wishes. Embrace him or her with compassion to make it easier.
fill everyone here with compassion. Everybody has the same difficulties, the same wishes and hopes, the same disappointments. Fill and embrace everyone here with compassion to ease the way. Feel your parents with compassion. Compassion for all the difficulties they've had, may still be having, for their striving and hopes and disappointments. Fill them, surround them with compassion. Fill those that are nearest and dearest to you with compassion. Compassion for all dukkha that has arisen and arises in their lives. Embracing them with compassion. Think of all your friends. Fill them from head to toe with compassion. Embrace them with compassion. For whatever is difficult for them, to help them, to ease the way for them. Think of anyone you know who may be having special difficulties at this time. Fill and embrace that person with your compassion. Full empathy, how difficult it is to be a human being.
think of all those people whose lives are far more difficult than ours in hospital, in prison, refugee camps, crippled, blind, hungry, in war-torn countries, without shelter, without friends. Embrace them all with a heart full of compassion, feeling with them, understanding their sorrow, caring and concerned. wanting to ease their way. Let your compassion reach out into